Thanks, Vince. Hi, everyone from Australia, where it's in our terms cold, it's about nine degrees Celsius, it's a reversal of fortunes. Um, <laughs> thank you all for tuning in or zooming in. Um, a special thank you to our seven participants and their commitment to learning about photography and teaching us about photography and to BPS as a club. Um, the program's pretty full, so I'm going to have to be pretty strict about timekeeping. Each segment will be about 15 minutes long. Ginny and Vince may use all their time because theirs is more of a tutorial uh, and there may not be any time for questions at the end of theirs. However, there should be time to share your photos or comments after the other presenters. Please don't be offended if I cut you off at the 15 minute mark. Uh, if it's the time at the end, I'll open up the meeting for further questions and comments. So we're gonna kick off with Vince, who's gonna talk about panoramas or panoramata, depending on your Latin. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna share Thank my you. screen. Don't start my clock yet, Lee. I know you're <laughs> oh, really? Stop. Oh, thanks for reminding uh, me, actually. <laughs> and you should all be now seeing my screen, I hope. Yeah. Okay. okay, 15 minutes starts now. All right, so I'm obviously talking about panorama photography. Um, the, I get it on myself. If, if there are questions, um, we'll get to them at the on end. The iPad. And if others can mute, that would be good. Um, and if need be, um, I, I'll be happy to stay at the end to go over some more technical details. And you can always email me, uh, VAP123, if you want more information or go over some issues. So the basic question would be, why do we do panoramas? Um, all right, well, I'll phone. just go upstairs and watch it on my phone. Um, can you go to mute, please? Um, so to, uh, one of the reasons would be to, um, if I get distracted, I'm trying to let somebody in who just popped in. I don't, if someone can look at that for me. Um, um, so one of the reasons for a pano would be to obtain a dramatic wide angle view uh, that you can't otherwise um, uh, get with your camera. And that could be either horizontally or vertically. Um, you might not have a lens wide enough to capture the scene that you want, either right to left or top to bottom. You might be in a very tight space and you might not be able to back up far enough to get the capture you want. Very importantly, you might want to avoid the built-in distortion that happens in perspective, uh, the, length, the shrinkage of the background or having too much sky or foreground all from wide angle lenses. And these, could, these issues can be minimized um, to a great extent uh, with panos. And you might desire or need a high resolution processed file for a print. Um, as you'll see tonight, these can easily get to a gigabyte in size. Um, so the process of um, uh, developing a panorama, or I'll go through that um, as the principles to set you up. The lens is typically a 24 to 70 millimeter. It could even be a telephoto. You'll see a couple examples of that. Ideally, there are uh, the multiple side-by-side -side images are done in a vertical orientation with your camera. And the reasons for that partially are the final outcome ends up being a bigger, higher resolution file because you have more vertical images side by side than if you did a couple horizontal. And it also then increases your um, space for cropping in the foreground and the sky. And there's an advantage to that in post. The basic principle in doing this um, is to overlap the images that you take a minimum of 20% up to 50% Generally, you do about 30% so that the imaging software that's used to stitch this can find the spots that are similar and do the matching. You need to keep in mind that um, um, you, you want to have um, uh, your scene uh, visualized so you can go from uh, shot to shot, perhaps picking a tree or a building and then maybe if you have a grid display in your viewfinder, watching where that marker is on the viewfinder 
if you want to be really technical, you can calculate the field of view and mark your tripod to match that. Oh, ended up so far. The actual process of doing your pano involves similar to when you're taking your typical one shot scene, you compose the scene, obviously. You need to be careful of movement in the scene, particularly if, if trees and water are not all going in the same direction um, and having trees and bushes in the foreground, these kinds of things make it harder for the software to blend. You decide on your focal length and set it and don't change it. You focus on one spot, your key subject, and then lock that in, ideally done on manual um, at that point so it doesn't change. And now determine your exposure and you need to pick the dominant portion of your scene. So you have the ideal histogram for that dominant area and then you'll match the rest of it as you do your blend. In making your exposure, you want to turn off auto ISO. You don't want that changing and you don't want your white balance changing. Uh, you pick the f-stop that you need for your depth of field, but keep in mind that if it's too shallow, the software will not be able to pick up uh, the registration points it needs to blend. Uh, so that could be a problem, say at f2.8. Uh, confirm your test shots, lock in your exposures, no filters on your lenses, on your lens because the angle of view will change and the filters will get messed up uh, or actually mess up the scene. So the shooting can be handheld or tripod. If it's handheld, you need to have a reference point, ideally the horizon to keep you flat and then rotate in place as if you're in a, on a pin or a monopod so that you establish a good smooth rotation. If you're on a tripod, it's critical that the top of the tripod be level um, and not tilt it if you're at an angle. And the easiest way to do that uh, is with a leveling base on the tripod. Uh, and ideally your tripod is equipped with a nodal point slide and I'll show you that. And a cable release is key so nothing moves and you don't knock the settings that you have for your camera um, angles and things such as that. This looks complicated. I'll only spend a brief moment on the nodal point or the other terms for it, the pupil entry point and the no parallax point. Um, parallax is when there is a shift in the, or displacement in the foreground versus the background due to different lines of sight as you do your rotation. And an easy way to see that is if you were to hold your thumb out and focus on your thumb with one eye and now rotate your head the background will change and that's parallax and that would ruin a pano image. And therefore you need to actually do your rotation of your camera lens on the nodal point. The nodal point is actually the physical spot in the inside of the lens where the image lines that are coming in at angles all meet together and converge. The image then gets flipped by the lens and projected onto the sensor in focus. And that nodal point is the point in which you would spin to avoid parallax. The nodal point has to be determined for each lens and if it's a zoom, typically for every focal length that you're going to use. However, I just found out last week, very uniquely, the Canon, my new Canon R5 zoom lenses have the exact same nodal point throughout both ranges of zooms one zoom to the other, they're exactly the same, which is pretty incredible lens design. Um, it, there is a detailed process in figuring out your nodal point. Uh, and then you use a nodal point slide to move the camera and lens forward and back uh, as you're experimenting to set, to find the nodal point and then to set it when you're out in the field. Um, and now you rotate on that nodal point and you minimize your parallax and you also get straight lines and don't have to do much cropping. So this is me out um, trying to demonstrate this setup. This is my camera tripod setup. The red line is the nodal point line and it's going straight up to this spot in the lens. And that's the spot where I can rotate this camera lens setup and have zero parallax. And that's opposed to the blue line, which is the tripod line that would normally be where the red line is. <clears throat> and if I was to rotate on this spot without this slide to adjust the camera lens to be at the nodal point, then I would have parallax. And the setup 
and I can go in detail on this subsequently, but basically I'm lining the camera up to two poles. You can use candlesticks, bottles, whatever you want, signs, and then shift the camera front to back on this slide so that when you turn right to left, you don't see the second pole peeking out. So I did this setup uh, purposely for this meeting over at Why Missing um, Park, and I set the tripod up on a hill, mimicking as if I was on the side of a mountain. So you can see the angle of the tripod is uh, at about 30 degrees. The tripod head, where the camera would normally be sitting, is quite angulated compared to what is level. You can adjust the tripod legs and play with that for about an hour, uh, or you can have a leveling base which this little piece is. And then the leveling base allows you to swivel the base of your uh, ball head or whatever you're using on your tripod so that you um, now have it perfectly level. There's a spirit level here and there are a couple other levels in this setup. So now using this wedge, the tripod top is perfectly level. And now I can spin in the vertical position and not have um, a problem with, with um, the leveling. And I've done my uh, nodal point so that I, with this slide, I had the camera set up at the nodal point. This particular image is um, uh, eight shots at 24 millimeters vertically um, at F11. Um, and then those shots um, are then taken in Lightroom you select the, the series you're going to use, right click on any of them, and this dialog box comes up in Lightroom and says, uh, one of the options, photo merge, and we select pano. Uh, it could also be an HDR pano. And now it gives you this preview image. Lightroom will use the center image as the um, set point and then match the other images side to side from it. Ideally, you've shot your images left to right in a sequence. But if the image is good enough, a nice depth of field, that, that may not be a problem for you. And you can see using the nodal slide, there's very little image loss. Uh, I can, again, go over this later uh, in light, how we go through Lightroom, but the, there are three different projections. The default is spherical. However, cylindrical usually works best um, for a uh, one row pano. You could do a multi-row. Um, there are some other settings which we can go over. If you like what you see, you hit merge and you end up with a raw image, which is quite important. Uh, you have another raw DNG file and now you process it like you would any other image. You do not process the initial individual images first because when you merge them over in Lightroom into a pano or an HDR, all your local adjustments get wiped out. They don't carry over. So all your uh, burn and dodge, et cetera, would be gone. So you save all that until you've processed your merged file and then you end up with something like this. This is a 441 megabyte um, file uh, from what I just showed you um, um, as the, the, all those images. I now have a couple examples I took for this evening's uh, talk. This is in a tight space. Um, I have my 24 millimeter shot here 73 degrees field of view, 53 uh, up and down. But when I do this as a vertical, I now have a 73 degree. I've gained 20 degrees of field of view vertically, take my shots and I end up with this image compared to that. Um, and now after fixing the, the, power, the perspective um, in perspective effects by DxO, uh, we have this as a final image again, this is was done just for tonight. Nothing special about this image. And you can crop it as you want, 357 megabit file. But I wanted to show you going uh, with more telephotos. This is a 50 millimeter lens, multiple images. This 887 gigabyte pano with almost no image loss along the borders. This is the full crop. And now you can take just a portion of it and blow that up as big as you want in a print because it's such a high resolution. A 70 millimeter pano, 11 shots. This is obviously way too close for this kind of image, but I wanted to show you that for distant scenes like valleys and mountains, this is a one gigabyte file. 
that could be cropped to take this and then make that 10 feet if you wanted to. Uh, that's the end of my talk, uh, but I do have a couple of examples. I have the details of the examples on the bottom I wanna share with you. Um, uh, and I'll just run through some of these. This is a vertical pano with a 24 millimeter setting. This is a 160 millimeter setting with eight um, horizontals. So you can see how long that field is. Eight horizontal shots at 160 millimeters with the uh, lens. Uh, this is a um, um, 35 millimeter. This is an HDR pano. It's a little too grungy for what I do today. Um, a four, four shot pano. This is a six shot with a 50 millimeter. It gives a really nice perspective. It keeps the background that house at a nice size. That house shrank to nothing at 24 millimeters. Um, another uh, pano. This is a 10 shot pano, which stitched together just gorgeously, gave me a lot of space top and bottom for my cropping. This is a 200 millimeter lens setting, three shot horizontal pano. So the telephoto really does a nice job with the pano and you don't have to use the whole thing. This was a seven shot pano, but this is only three images used for this particular one. And my last, I wanted to show you a handheld uh, done in writing just for tonight. Um, I, did pretty well, I lost a little bit on my sides because I, I was losing with my spin. Using um, boundary warp in Lightroom, I, it stretched the pixels out and then I did some perspective control and got the final um, image. And there I am at 15. <laughs> Sorry, your time's up, come out of the water. <laughs> and I'll stop sharing, I got thrown off by a couple admit admissions. So um, that I'll was great. And, uh, and answer any questions and email me VAP123 at AOL.com. Okay. Vince, that was, that was really excellent. Thank you. And I, I hope we have time at the end for people to come back. Um, the next one presenter is Ginny, and she's going to talk about custom Photoshop brushes. So, Ginny. Yes. Hey, everybody. I'm going to just talk for a second to let you know that this is very different from what Vince just did. This is more just a, something to do for fun. When Lee needed somebody to share, I jumped in and said, here's something I just learned about. This is kind of cool. I can share this. Um, I like to use my own assets whenever I can, rather than getting things from, you know, online or getting other, using other people's things. So to figure out a way to make my own shaped brushes was something I wanted to learn how to do. And there's lots of ways to use i'm going to just give you a couple quick ways and i'm going to show you two different brushes that i made one is a leaf and one is a cloud and how you could use those so let's jump in i'm going to share my um, photoshop screen here so you can see that right yes okay super so um there's a few steps to creating your own brush. And this is a leaf that I photographed on a, um, on a light board. So it has a perfectly white background, which is important to be able to make a brush out of it. Can I make this little thing go away at the top? I really know, it's sort of annoying, but anyway. Okay. Um, so what you do need to, to start out is something that has a white background. Um, now you could take this image and you could turn it um, using image and adjustments, you could make this a black and white image. And you could make these uh, the blacks in here a little bit darker because uh, most of this was like yellow and the original image and some red. So you could do that or you could actually just do it from its normal color here. So what I'm going to do first is take my um, rectangular marquee tool and go around my leaf. That would be your first step. Then in your edit menu, you may not have known this was in here. There's something called define brush preset. Oh, and by the way, I will have um, directions for how to do this if you're interested in trying this crazy idea uh, attached to the next newsletter. So at this point, you can give this a name and I'm gonna call it um, leaf uh, six, because I don't know how many leaves I've already done, and say, okay. 
And now you see my brush is a leaf. Do you see that it's a leaf? So I can use my bracket keys. Uh oh, I just painted on there. Let me undo that. Um, or I can use control and alt and drag down to create a different size like this. So I'm going to go over here to this um, black this black square that I already created. And you'll see that I have a blank layer on top of there. So if I were to click on here, you'd see I can actually paint with the brush that I just created. But that's kind of boring. First of all, it's white, so that's boring. And if I try to paint with it by dragging, I get something that looks like that. And that's not very useful either. So I'm going to go to my brush settings. Um, wait a minute. Yes, I do find it. I'm making sure I haven't forgotten to give you any layers, <clears throat> any um, steps. So to get to your brush settings, there's three different ways. You can go over here on the right in the panel and open up your brush settings here. Or you can use um, the F5 key, and that will open up your, should open up your brush settings. Or you can go up to um, window and say brush settings, and you'll get your brush settings right here. So in their brush settings, you have a lot of options that you may or may not have known you have for brushes in Photoshop. And one of the options, the first thing is here in the brush tip shape. Now, if you look down at the bottom, this is what sh is going to happen if you just drag this leaf brush that I just made. But I can change the spacing so that the leaves are separate from each other. I can go then down to the second thing in the brushes, uh, which is the shape dynamics, and I can change the I can change the sizes as I brush. The size will they call it size jitter, so it will change as I'm as I'm brushing along. I can have a minimum diameter and a maximum diameter there if I want to, and I can also change the angle jitter so that all the brush. Uh, leaves are not facing the same direction. So I can go like this and make it so they'll be randomly turned. And I can change the roundness jitter so they sort of tilt and pivot. So they might actually look like they're falling. Um, so there's what I would do in the shape dynamics. Now I'm going to move down to the scattering. And here's where I can have them sort of scatter you can see what happens if i drag that way over now this would work also if you had some sort of a snowflake type of a of a look or something and you wanted to create some snow i'm using this leaf but you could do anything different from that i'm going <clears> to <throat> change the count here a little bit for what i want i don't know if i want to have that too much and then um finally we're going to go down here to the color dynamics. This is really fun. You need to check this box here to apply per tip. And this is your foreground and background color, and it will jitter the colors between the two. This hue will change the hue of the colors. So I'm going to leave that kind of low. And I'll move the brightness. This is where you get to play around a little bit, and then you test it and you see what you think. All right, so I'm going to leave it like that for the moment. Now we do need to change our foreground and background colors. So for a uh, leaf, I might want to pick something orange for that. And then for my background, I'm going to pick something more yellowy. So here's my foreground and background colors. And I am painting on a uh, new blank layer. Anytime you add anything in Photoshop, you want to be on a new blank layer. And I also want to check up here my flow and make sure that I'm at 100% because I prefer with this type of thing to be at 100% when I'm painting. And then um, uh, I can always change the opacity of the layer later. So if I now if I float my um, paint with my brush, you can see that my leaves are going in different directions. And I could use this for a lot of different things. And what I love about it is this is a leaf 
picture that I took myself. I could use this to make a, a design or a card or something. I could change this, the um, size of the leaf and add some littler leaves in here. Um, let me turn that layer off, add another layer. Now I know why people get frustrated by this when they're sharing their screen, because I have all these people at the bottom and I can't get to my, hold on, let's do this. I'm going to add another blank layer. Uh, now I'm going to try something that's uh, a fun little Photoshop trick. And it's up here at the top. It's for your symmetry. And have you ever made a mandala? Vince, have you ever made a mandala? I have not. I don't uh, know what that is. All right. Well, you will in a minute. So I'm going to make this. Uh, I'm going to go with um, nine segments and you see i have this little um image here showing me what what's that now i recognize what it is okay so now i'm going to go back to <laughs> i'm going to go back to my brush my leaf brush i'm going to make it a little bit bigger here and as i paint it's going to create a design based on this um uh, nine uh spoke mandala and so now i can make it i can make my leaf small and add some tiny things in there and now isn't that cool did you know you could do that with photoshop so exciting uh, i think you can turn off the blue line if you want to so you can see it a little I'll throw a little thing in the middle and now you've got a design that you made yourself now you could also take these leaves if you wanted to and you could add them to an image. You know, maybe you've got, you took your child out sitting and I couldn't find the exact right image that I thought would work for this. But you could use this to sort of add to an image or if you're doing some type of a composite um, and you wanted to add something fun to it. Uh, my next example is this cloud. Now this is not so easy because at this point I've got I don't have a black and white. I don't have a white background. So what I'm going to do first is change this image in the image adjustments to black and white. Now, I want this blue sky to be completely black. So I'm going to take my blues and bring them all the way over and my cyans, because there's cyan in the sky too. So that's pretty good. All right, but oh, the problem is that the brush is whatever is black. So I need to hold down control or command on a Mac and the eye to invert my image so that the black is white and the white is black, which should be happening. There we go. Okay, so now I've got this little cloud here. I'm going to take my rectangular marquee again and select the cloud, edit. Define brush preset. Now you can use this in Photoshop Elements too. It, I've, I've done this exact same thing in Elements. It's instead of saying define brush preset in Elements, it's define new brush. I'm gonna call this um, cloud, clouds, I'll call this clouds. Oh, I forgot to say something about the other one. Okay, I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, so now I have my cloud and um, going to go to my settings and I'm going obviously if I painted with my cloud right now this is what it would look like so I definitely want to change the spacing and I want to change my dynamics a little bit change the angle maybe change the roundness somewhat add a little bit of scatter and I don't want to do anything with the um, color dynamics on this one now, once I, let me, let me just get rid of Okay, so now I have this image and let's say I wanted to just add a little bit of extra fog here at the bottom. I can, first of all, start it, add a new layer, add a new blank layer. Of course, I'm gonna do that first. So I'm working on this blank layer. I'm gonna go back to a white and I'm just gonna paint in a little bit of extra mist you say oh jenny that is just so overdone yeah i know 
So I'm going to go to opacity and just pull that down. And you get the idea. I might have that a little bit too big. I might make another layer for some really big ones and bring that really far down so you get the idea you can actually add into your image with this you could use this same brush to create smoke above a, a city scene or something like that um okay so that's what you do now if you know that you like the brush the way you just created it you would go in here to your brushes and you'll see I can't see because you people are all there. Oh, let me do this. No, that doesn't do it. Yeah, that does it. Um, you can see here that here's my clouds brush. And at this point, it is not showing all of its. Let me look at the brush settings again. I don't know why it's not showing that. Um, once you get that the way you want it, you can click this plus right down here to save that brush so that when you go back to it, it's like that. Or well, right now, it should have should have shown that, and I don't know why it didn't. But anyway, if I click this here, it's going to ask me, what do you want to call it? So I'm going to call it clouds one scattered. And that way I can come back and use that brush again. Am I out of time? Got it. About 30 okay. seconds. That's my 30 seconds. Okay, hold on. Um, okay, so the other another place where I happen to use this cloud, this similar cloud brush was this other project I'm working on where I added some clouds on top of this um, city in the clouds image that I've been working on. And you can see that without the clouds, it's just not as good. These these clouds kind of add an extra little oomph to the picture. So that's it. I am done sharing. That was great, Jenny. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Wow. Was, yeah, very That good. was awesome, Jenny. Yeah. I think uh, we all know what we're going to be doing for the next few well, weeks. <laughs> I have instructions here. Um, can you see them? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah. anyway, uh, it, it's not that hard, and it's super fun. Thank you, Jenny. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, now, Jeff is going to talk about capturing the action and spirit of some long South Indian word. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So mine is, let's see, can you see my share? Yep. Yeah. So mine is, yeah, capturing the action and spirit of Kalari Payatu, which is the Indian martial arts. Uh, a lot of you heard some of this before, saw some of the image over the last couple of years, but from that, you know, that is my special interest and passion. And I thank Kutu, if you see him on screen, for joining us tonight, because he's part of this whole journey. Uh, so it's also capturing people and action. So for me, it is what energizes me the most as a photographer. If I can capture somebody doing something that they are very passionate about, it kind of excites me. And, uh, and I get a lot out of that. And I'll show you something toward the end that I'm starting to work on now. Uh, but early days, this was my first shot at capturing action. So honestly, I wasn't quite sure what I was doing. And I went to a colliery show. The one thing it did was it really got me interested in it. But then I got back to my homestay and looked and I thought, oops. <laughs> but I was fully automatic at the time. And this was in 2016. Didn't really know what I was doing. So now as I look back, well, no wonder I have them. Now, this would kind of be cool if he was frozen. So that's my next thing is to figure out how to capture this and keep him frozen. So we have some work to do till my next trip. But overall, this has helped me work on a lot of different things. Uh, over the years, it helped me develop 
and learn skills and how to capture actions, the kind of settings I needed. Because again, pretty new and most of it was automatic when I started. So lots of reading, lots of things, lots of things we get from our, our different sessions help me to know what kind of settings to use. Also for me, what's important is trying to capture the feeling and emotion, not just the action when I'm doing things to help tell the overall story. Working with light, I didn't do a lot with flash, a lot with lights before, and even low light. So these collieries that you're in are very, oftentimes very dark. So trying to learn how to work with higher ISOs and where to use a natural light, Flash is newer for me. And now I learned things since the last trip that I got to try the next trip. Uh, reviewing and culling images, that's hard for me. I come back and now I have 12,000 colliery images and I'm not good at throwing things away in life or in film. So if they're really, really bad, I can get rid of them if they're not I move into the next thing, which is post-processing. So when you have 12,000 things to work with, you have a lot to play with different types of software. So I've used all of it uh, in one aspect or another with this. But one of the other things, in addition to these skills, is trying to understand the art. And I'm photographing a martial art. It's when I'm doing yoga, it's something I'm photographing something different and been trying some other things. So it's really understanding and starting to learn more about what you're photographing helps you photograph it better. So these are more from this past year. So this was a very dark gallery. I mean, not extremely dark, but darker. So this was an extremely high ISO. It's and I'm in there and people are doing stuff. They're either jumping, then when I have them still, somebody decides to do action stuff, then they go back to still. So it's trying to get the settings right, but I learned a bit more on shutter speeds and kind of how to capture this. ISOs were high. I used Topaz Denoise AI, which is a neat software I like. I know you can do it in other things, but that helped get rid of some of that noisiness and you know, a little bit better than my one from three or four years before uh, outside capturing this. So this was kind of neat. This was better light, easier light, but still I think something I learned was I still might have to adjust the ISO up. I always kept it at a hundred when I was outside and it's like, I guess I do bump it to learn how to do faster shutter speeds or higher apertures. So again, just things I needed to learn as I go along. Uh, actually, this is Kutu up in the air, but this was one we used the high action and also is working with the environment around you to kind of, in addition to getting the action, how do you best frame it? How do you best incorporate the environment you're in? Uh, yeah, and this is on the beach. Some of you might have seen that a couple months ago in the newsletter, but this is in a newspaper in in uh, India, one of the national newspapers, but it was one of the cool ones that we did on the beach. So again, lot, lots of learning, uh, changing the angles. This is Kutu's idea, I'll admit. I'm not sure if it was a good one, <laughs> but they dug a pit and buried me in it so that I could take the photo jumping over what we learned quickly was when you jump in the sand, the sand covers the guy in the pit. So, <laughs> so probably wasn't the best idea, but I, I loved the picture that we got. We only got one or two. And then uh, I said, I, I better not, because I want to save the camera and myself. But then again, other shooting angles, you know, it's one on the right hand bottom. It was the end of a long night, but they said, how about take our picture from on the ground. So we grabbed things and I laid on the ground and we did some lighting, but kind of was a different kind of look to them. And up here in the left, it was more just they're in action. How do I capture it to kind of give a different feel 
of being in the action. So again, just learning different shooting angles, perspectives, and other things. There's a lot of action and things happening, but looking for other stuff and moments in a colliery, I think, help to tell the whole story. I mean, this little kid I just loved because he was just watching and you could just tell someday I'm going to be in there with big kids. I think he might have been because I have a picture of this tiny little kid doing stuff at the at the end of one of these sessions. But again, or, or just a moment that he was, you know, prayerful to the, uh, okay, help me, <laughs> help me, Kuta, the Putera. It's called the Putra. Putra. I was close. Putra in the corner. So just a moment he was worshipful. It wasn't set up. It's just I try to observe those things while I'm doing the action stuff to capture those kind of moments and and help add to the story. Uh, again, light. I use a lot of natural light. So then it's looking for different things in that colliery that give the right setting. Flash, I don't do a lot of flash. So fill flash, I started working with this last trip when I was outside to kind of give a better effect to the people. And, and uh, so working with that. This one, loom cubes, is a little cube that lets out a whole lot of light. And I can't travel heavy because I have enough stuff I'm carrying around. So I got a couple of these this time. And this is actually Kutu up in the corner and another girl in the colliery. They, they're the lighting crew and we work to try to get the best settings. This was a very dark colliery and, uh, and this was the end image. So the lighting really just helped and I could do it without flash and other things and we could design a bit with the light. The same with these, using those little loom cubes and kind of getting the look that you wanted and then capturing it, I think added a lot to the images. Post-processing for me is, and this is where I have a hard time with the culling, because I, after you look at them for a while, you start to see the photo in the photo. So this is one, it was a little too grainy and detailed, but I thought, what happens if I make it a little more grungy and zero in? and kind of like what happened with it. Uh, another one, I took this specifically to get a nice uh, silhouette, but then after our key, our course on high key images, I thought, I wonder what I could pull back. And then this one to the right is what I did with that. So I think it was kind of a neat image, but that was another one. I, I saw something different later. This one too, I liked his expression. We got hit by waves. Uh, sorry, Kuto, I cut you out of here, but I, re, I redid this kind of cut him out and zeroed in and gave us a little sunset view. But I think again, gave a different dynamic image of one I, I might've thrown away because it wasn't exactly what I was looking at at first. Here was another one, didn't do much for me this way, but when I ended up with this, I liked what that did and, and so did he. He's used that a bunch of different places. Again, using a little more high key. Uh, this too, I, I like the expression. I didn't like the photo. But then it's like, if I zero in in black and white, see what that would do. Uh, and I think created a more dynamic one. So I can revisit and revisit. And this is the last one, but this is one I often shoot in a burst mode. And I had, the only thing I was trying to get was him here. If you can see my cursor kind of in this one at the top. And then I brought it up in Lightroom and saw this and thought, there's something in here. I like them combined. So then that I learned some Photoshop compositing, YouTube, trial and error, and then came up with this one. And he really likes it. And it's gotten popular with some of the colliery guys, but kind of did the blending, put them together, kind of like dark to light to dark. Uh, so 
that's it for the calorie piece. What I'm trying, since I can't get back to India right now, looking for other things. So my next thing is to find skateboarders willing to work with me. So I've been frequenting the uh, local skate park and found a few that were willing to let me try and have a new camera. So trying to work on capturing action that way and hopefully do that in some creative ways. So that's it. Thank you, Jeff. That was fascinating. It's amazing where someone's passion can take them. Um, and I think, I think your photos are magnificent. Has anybody mm -hmm. got anything they'd like to share? Any photos of India they'd like to share? Or um, sports or comments. That was really wonderful, Jeff. Uh, very creative. I like your zooming in effects um, of the cropping of your image, images. Really nice work. Thanks. And your lighting really was great. I agree. Like I it. love that. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. And like I said, I have to travel light, so it's trying to figure out what to do. And I have a lot to learn with flash and things that I didn't think I could do. Then I get home and I read and it's like, oh, shoot, I could have shot burst mode with a flash if I adjust it right. <laughs> so I got to try that next time. Last time, it's like aim those little lights. Uh, yeah, aim the little lights right so that I could try to get it because trying to get folks at the right angle, especially when multiple are going, we're kind of tough. Uh, yeah, I'll say goodbye to Kutu. He has to teach a class. Thank you, Kutu, for joining us. Uh, like I said, he's been a big part of this journey, so appreciate it. Uh, yeah, so so yeah, and you just you just I think the neat thing is you just try something and just keep learning, and uh, and you find a passion and it it grows. So. I like the uh, low angle shots and the one where you were in the pit in the sand, I thought maybe you could have put some kind of plastic either over just the camera or yeah. yourself as well. And then make what might have looked, made it look a little dreamy or serialistic and protected your camera at the same time. Yeah. Maybe next time this was, this is a bunch of guys, me and their shovels. So they said, we brought the shovels. We're digging you holes. <laughs> I'm down in the hole, and I thought, well, this right, will work. 20, Twenty takes, and you're buried. <laughs> yeah, well, well, it was one. It was they ran, and it's like, oh, this isn't gonna work. I actually took all the sand off of his outfit too in post because he had all this sand all over himself, and I had to do that. But yeah, they they're kind of fun to try something different, and that. That was the thing I had willing group of people that like to try different things. And uh, well, uh, it's like, I've never tried this, but I saw some one time somebody use an empty fish aquarium and place it down in a pond, had his camera in the aquarium. And then it like had a waterproof housing over it. And he was able to, to shoot underwater without yeah. damaging the camera. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, right. he's going to talk to us about airplane photography. So, Tom, you're on. Okay, let me get my shared screen up here. Yeah, you're there. I oh, know you don't. I'm getting there. Yep. You should see it, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. So I thought uh, one of the things I enjoy doing a lot of is, is shooting. Uh, airplanes and, and air shows. And so I thought I'd run through a quick tip, a few quick tips. Um, one of the, oh, I got to move everybody around here so I can see what I'm doing. Um, one of the key things is, is I, now that I've gone and shot a number of shows over the years, is to try and capture the moment, uh, the story in one image. That usually means in an air show, there's a lot of motion either propellers, aircraft, people moving around, a lot of motion in, in, in an air show and shutter speed ends up being one of the key things. And panning, as we'll see in a moment, is a key skill that really needs to be worked on if you're gonna try and get uh, movement that's really uh, impressive. And I'll talk about that. The other thing is 
it doesn't, doesn't all have to be up in the air. There's a lot of shapes. Um, and, and look for them when you're walking around an air show using different uh, lens links and so on. I didn't put too much in this uh, presentation, but uh, you can see by the image on the right here, there's just a lot of interesting shapes, particularly on the older aircraft, all aircraft. Um, and one last point is uh, try and find a person or a situation that makes a story with your aircraft or with the object that you're photographing. It adds uh, so much to what's going on. Um, so let's talk about settings because that's really the, the, the nut of the whole thing. Um, many times, most of the times I'm shooting, I'm using a long lens and uh, uh, full frame camera equivalent of about 300 millimeters or longer. Um, question? Okay. Um, Usually you want to be in continuous autofocus since there is so much motion going on. Um, you, you want to you uh, you want to be either be I think it's either called servo on many systems, but you want to be once either using back button back button focus or holding your shutter halfway down so that the focus is continuously working. Um, I usually use manual exposure. It offloads the camera processor, particularly when you're using autofocus and or tracking. There's a lot of processing that's going on. And if you can move to manual focus, it, it makes things move, your camera work better, frankly. Um, usually the light is not going to change much when you're in a certain situation. So if you're shooting an aircraft pass or if you're shooting over a particular hour or so on, once you have your manual uh, exposure set up, it doesn't matter much where you're shooting or pointing because this, the, uh, the sun or the, the light is not gonna change. Whether you're shooting in shadow or sunlight, if you have the right exposure, it's gonna be about right. Um, the main thing is main, try not to overexpose clouds so that when you're swinging in and, and catching clouds, which can add a lot of drama to the image, you wanna make sure you don't blow those out. Shutter speed, um, if you're doing a non-rotational aircraft, that is jets or other, or gliders or things that don't have rotating parts in them, either a 400th to a thousandth or even higher, if you can do that, but you wanna keep an F-stop relatively small, uh, meaning a five, six or higher, um, to get a reasonable depth of field since you have, usually you're shooting with a long lens. So the more you can get down up to a five, six, an eight, 11, but don't go much higher than 11. Um, mainly because you're going to start losing light or you're going to have to increase your ISO and usually you don't want to try and stay away from that. So rotating aircraft, which is the crux of what I like to do, um, usually about 1 60th to 1 200th in order to get a prop blur or a rotor blur so that the aircraft has some dynamic look to it um, is what you want to shoot with. That means in order to get a sharp photo, you really have to develop your panning skills. It's a major thing necessary to capture an aircraft in flight um, or to project motion, as we'll talk about in a minute, which could be in the background, but you want to be able to, to pan. So I'll go through some examples. Um, here's an, it, it's unfortunate that uh, the Reading Air Show was this past weekend and it was a, it's the first time in two years they've had the show and it was really quite a lot of fun. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about quickly, and I forgot to put it in my charts, where I usually shoot, shoot in burst mode. Um, I'm not always clicking off, but it's there if I get everything right that I can use burst. Um, so I came away from three days of the air show with 3,000 images, of which if I save in my initial call about 300, and then I'll go back through them again. And if I end up with 30 or 40 really good images, that's what I consider to be successful. So if you try this and you don't get a lot the first time, if you're getting one out of 10 or one out of 20, don't get frustrated. If you end up with one out of six or one out of seven, you're doing pretty good. So let's take a look at some examples of shutter speed and why I like to go slow with the shutter speed. Here's a 600 millimeter equivalent lens F5 in, a, in 1 320th. And if you, you look, and I'm gonna blow this up here a little bit, um, I'm going to pull it over. The prop 
is moving, but it doesn't, it kind of looks weird to me anyway. It looks like it's kind of just pasted up there somehow. The, the aircraft is hanging there. Um, and from a side shot, it doesn't look too bad, but if you get more from the front or the back, you'll see everything kind of stops. Um, let's see if I can go to the next. Okay, so I got to go back to, let me decrease it. Here's, here's a little better example. Here's a 1 800th shutter speed. Now, the advantage, of course, is after you shoot a couple at, you know, a hundredth or a hundred and a quarter, one over 125, many of them get blurry and you're going, why don't I just increase the shutter speed? Well, if you look at this aircraft, you can see, again, it looks a little weird. This is eight hundredth of a second. It, it just doesn't look right. So what, what you really would look for to try and get is something more along the lines of this. Okay, here's a 1 25th of a second, and you get aircraft that are seem to be, there's an, an illusion of motion because something's blurred and something's moving. If you can see there, what it, you can see a little bit, the props are blurred out. Um, with these aircraft, you won't see a circle because the props don't have any white tips, but it looks, to my mind, um, a lot better. The other thing is the background usually blurs out a bit too, so you get the whole um, effect of, of motion. Oops, went too fast. Here's one of the better images I got over the weekend. Um, this is a 1 60th of a second, and here you can really see a blur. The ideal is to get a full circle. So if I could have, if you can see this, the props, you know, are really going about an eighth of a, a full circle. So if I had gone, it's a four bladed prop. If I had got the prop to go a quarter of a, of a circle, I would have had a full circle. So if I got half of that with 160th, if I slowed it down to 180th, I would have had a full circle. Getting this with an aircraft moving 300, 400 miles an hour by you uh, at eighth of a second, you don't get a lot. I mean, you can shoot 20, 30, 40. If you get one, you're really fortunate. Um, but that's what what I, at least I think, a good air, uh, air show photo begins to look like. Another thing, um, really look around when you're at a show. Uh, try and get to different perspectives in terms of this was shot at one end of the runway on one day, and the next day I went to a completely different location. But what you're looking for is to try and, and capture some context in terms of what's going on. So at one particular point from the vantage point I took, the aircraft on takeoff would be going by the background of all the other aircraft in an added perspective versus just a simple, back, you know, either a white background or just trees or since this was a vintage air show, if you get a lot of, uh, modern things in the background, it's it's a little more jarring than if you try and get something that has other context. So that's an idea. The other thing is um, is tracking and, and continuous uh, focus. It's, it's really a skill to be able to keep the target in focus as you're sweeping, particularly over a cluttered background. This just gives you an idea of what, what you deal with. The upper left photo, you can see the background is nice and sharp and focused as I'm panning. And I obviously didn't get the, the tracking and my, my autofocus was not centered on the plane. Whereas if, and particularly using your back button focusing, you can bump the focus. In other words, you can turn it on, turn it off, or turn it off, turn it back on again and have it reacquire relatively quickly. And hopefully you reacquire on the plane and you keep doing that and trying to keep that centered for the tracking and keeping the focus there. That's just another skill. While it looks easy to capture a picture like this, it's not easy at many times. The other thing is to try and look for some interest. I thought this was interesting, either people, pilots, or so on. Uh, they were paying, paying passengers, taking rides up in the vintage bombers, and the guy in the nose was having a, a, a healthy good time on this one. Um, and it just added a little bit of interest also gives you a real perspective on these old bombers and what they do and what people flew them had to live through.
Uh, let's see. One last last thing. Um, keep your eyes open. Um, there's a lot of activity going on. As I was shooting planes, uh, I noticed they had there was smoke rising from the far side of the field where they were having a a mock battle going on. And again, positioning yourself and waiting for aircraft to line up with the smoke gave an image that I thought was kind of uh, a little leery. Um, this was a Japanese Zero, one of the vintage aircraft at the show, uh, flying into some black smoke, and it gave a real context of for the image. And that's it. I think. I thought I had one more. Nope. That's it. Thank you, Tom. Um, I love warbirds, and I was really pleased when you volunteered to to show these. And um, uh, yeah, it's really good. Has anybody got any photos they'd like to share? Any plane photos? Yeah, this is this is Bill. I have a couple. Yep. <laughs> hey, Tom, uh, your presentation is uh, one uh, about four days too late. I was yeah. at the air show <laughs> on Friday and had a brain check because. I was used to shooting birds in flight at one two thousandth of a second. Um, and of course, I hadn't really planned on shooting uh, planes in, in flight because we're walking around the grounds. But uh, when I saw them, I you know just started blasting away burst mode. And, and I got some shots that were really sharp. But then I'm looking, I said, oh, my gosh, these would have been fantastic if I would have had the shutter blur. <laughs> I mean, uh, the propeller. Um, right. Blur. Right. So let me see if I can. Uh, can you unshare your screen, Tom? Sure. Okay. That should do it. No, I got to see where they are here. I got uh, dual monitors, and um, <laughs> are you seeing anything yet? No. No. How about now? Just your name. Pardon me? No. Maybe you should uh, turn your video on. Start your video. Yeah. Well, this is too. Uh, He's on. not on video, probably. Yeah. When, when you're doing share screen, Bill, are you sharing your desktop or the individual? The individual screen. The individual. There you go. There we go. There we are. So you're seeing them okay? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, for example, I thought this was kind of a cool shot. Uh, you get the telephoto uh, compression. You know, it looked like a miniature plane that it's flying over, but right. but there's not really any motion. This one is really you know nice and sharp, everything in detail, but the propellers aren't moving. It was like the engine shut off. <laughs> right. Somebody's hanging uh, it from the ceiling. Yeah, and then, uh, you know, same here. And then, uh, you know, I saw Vince was there the same uh, day. He said, well, you should listen to Tom. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, so yeah. now it's a, you know, a matter of honing panning technique and, uh, you know, trying to get the, um, uh, the, the shutter speed right. And I'm assuming that depending on uh, the, the size of the plane that, you know, may vary from, you know, one fiftieth to uh, you know probably one two fiftieth. Well, that, and that's it, you. You're really setting the shutter speed to capture the prop. So the prop's always moving roughly at the same speed. So anywhere from about an eightieth of a second up to two hundredth of a second, you're going to get reasonable blur. The the real skill is trying to capture, get the body of the aircraft sharp while while you're shooting at that sh slow shutter speed, as you probably found out things move by you pretty quickly. So the other thing which I didn't talk about, I could have said a little more about was if you if you shoot a little bit more head on or a little bit more tail on, you know, the speed isn't as great. So if you start there catching planes coming at you or moving away from you, um, it's a little more forgiving than if you're trying to catch them as they're swinging right by you. Right. You really got to pan exactly right on that one. Um, so just some ideas. Okay, thank you. So, Bill, I did listen Dude. to Tom, and my pictures are lousy. <laughs> I knew the shutter speed thing. I got that down, but the panning was a mess. 
Yeah, my, my wife told me what I was doing one day when I, I went up the road a bit and sat near 422 off the highway about a quarter mile and was shooting cars going by at 60 and 70 miles an hour. I figured the rate they were going by me was about the same as the, the, the angular rate was about the same as the distance I was watching planes going by at 200, 300 miles an hour. So it's just an idea. If you want to develop your speed, just go begin to shoot some things that are moving and just see what you can do. Okay, I'm going to use presenter's privilege here and share my screen and show some, if I can, and show some photos of a air show in Outback Australia that I went to before yeah, I heard neat. Tom's talk. <laughs> so I'll see what happens. Um, uh, I can't do it at the moment, so we won't worry about it. So next person, um, Joe is going to talk about IndyCar photography. So, Joe, are you there, Joe? Hello? I think Can you, you muted me? yourself, Joe. Muted it now. Is that better? I double clicked. Yeah, I can uh, hear you. You can hear me now? Yes. Yep, and see okay. you. Uh, what, what I'm going to talk about is very similar to what Tom just talked about. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of commonality because we're dealing about speed. Uh, I'm going to take a little different approach, though. Uh, I do a lot of racing photography, but I do other sports photography, too, and, and there's some common uh, components. One is access, one is equipment, knowledge of the sport, and technique. Now, access is the thing that you have the least con control over because, well, I mean, everything's a little different. I was lucky to have uh, access using media cred uh, uh, credentials for a lot of uh, sports photography. This photograph uh, in this slide was my very first shot or my first time photographing uh, IndyCar racing in 1976 up at Pocono using uh, press credentials from Penske. So, I mean, I've we, always- been, We can't I, see your slides. Do you, did you share oh, your screen? Oh, wait a minute, I'm sorry. Let me try that again. I thought it clicked on. How's that? Yeah. Now we got it. I will go. Okay, there we go. I was wondering where you guys disappeared to. So, so anyway, so this photograph was my very first 1976 uh, time photographing IndyCar racing at the Pocono. Uh, so you have access, you have equipment, and equipment is important, but you can also get equipment pretty easily. Like you can rent it from Lens Rental. Uh, and it's a lot less expensive than it was in the, in the past. So having the right equipment to photograph the sport you're doing, in my case, IndyCar, you need uh, generally some long reach lenses. Knowledge of the sport is super important because uh, if you want to really get good shots, you have to anticipate what's going to happen. Uh, so the more you can, the more you know what the circumstances are going to be on the racetrack, in this case, the, the better you're going to be prepared to take a good picture. And then there's technique. And I'm going to talk mostly about technique because the other things you have somewhat control and some of you don't. So I'm just going to identify a couple of things that I use, and that's stacking, which is my term, tilting, which is post-production, planning, which is a weird version of technique, but I'll, I'll get into it a little bit later, weather and panning. Uh, so when you go to the racetrack, a lot of people take this picture because they're interested in the cars. Uh, it's similar to what uh, Tom was talking about, where if you have a good, or Bill, I guess, you have a good sharp photograph, and this isn't the sharpest because normally I throw these away, uh, but it, it, it just looks, this car could be stopped in the, in the middle of the racetrack. He could be ordering a pizza, who knows? There's no form of, of there's no sense of motion, no sense of racing, and I think, what I try to do with racing photography is, is to create the racing feel. And this one doesn't do it. Although I love the scar. I mean, it's, it's uh, Dixon and his target Coca-Cola. It's really doesn't really talk about racing. So when I talk about stacking, I talk about putting cars front and back so that you feel like you're, you're seeing somebody competing. And in this case, the, the 25 car is ahead of the 20 car. You know there's an overtake. Uh, 
and you know that they're competing, or you think that they are anyway. I mean, they they could be stopped too, but 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 all appearances would say that they're they're working against each other. And this also shows uh, the tilting. I I give a little bit of a tilt to create a little bit more emphasis that the cars are coming around a turn. Uh, you can see the 25 car, his helmet is turned to the right. Everything's turned to the right, so you know that they're driving and making a hard right turn. And I think it creates a more of a, a visual impact uh, on what's happening with the drivers and the cars. This is the same thing from the opposite side. This is Yildi Castroneves going into a left-hand turn. Obviously, he had a little problem before this because one of his car is gone. Uh, <laughs> a little bit of tilt, a little bit of stacking. But you, you can see that the 83 car is looking uh, forward to try and to, to see what he might be able to do against uh, Elio in the three. This is, uh, Lee might understand this one really well. This is Australian supercar. Uh, yep. And this is the first time I ever photographed them. And this is down at Coda, which is the circuit, the uh, circuit of the Americas down in Austin, Texas. And uh, I walked around for a couple of days. Most racing, uh, photography I, I do is, is a three-day project, Friday to Sunday, and I take about 8,000 pictures because digital is cheap. So I went down there and I found out that uh, that the uh, Australian supercars, they're way more aggressive in the turns where the open-wheel racing guys like IndyCar are more more conservative because their cars are more delicate where these guys aren't. So they, they go into these turns very aggressively and I, I realized pretty quickly, this is an area called the S's, that, uh, that there would be a lot of action of this sort. So I just waited for these guys to come and cut the corner. And I tried to stack them so you can see the cars behind them. And I burst it so that I could find a, a shot where I knew the, uh, the front end was going to be off the ground. And, uh, and, it, and it, to me, it makes the, the, the most dramatic effect for this, this portion of the racetrack. When I talked about uh, renting lenses, uh, most uh, when I go onto a racetrack, I have a 24 to 70, a 70 to 200, and a 200 to 400 millimeter. And a 204 mil, 200 to 400 millimeter Nikkor lens was about $10,000 new. I picked mine up for about $5,000 on eBay. I rented it the first time to see if I liked it, but then I then I bought one. But the the, the be able to reach into the the cockpit. And and uh, and really bring myself close to the to the race or the racer is important. So this uh, using this long lens uh, really got me in close. And I put a little tilt on this one also. There's no stacking, uh, but it got me in so that you can almost feel, you can almost see what he's seeing. You can almost feel what he's feeling. I think my opinion, I guess. Now when I talked about planning. Uh, there's a lot of parts of the racetrack. The race, a racetrack uh, outside of an oval like Pocono has about 15 turns and about four or five of them are very competitive turns and the rest of them aren't. And the straightaways are really are very, very uh, bland and, and there's not much going on on the straightaways. So, so as a photographer, you, you go and you find where there's going to be action and that's usually in the turns. In this particular one, it was a, uh, a turn where the cars come from the, the right side and I can't see them and they come up over this hill and they turn right towards me and there's a very limited race uh, line. So I knew that they were going to be there and so I went from uh, aperture preferred and you know some automatic controls to full auto, a full manual. So I pre-focused on this point of the track. I pre I mean, I pre-selected the exposure so my lens wasn't cer uh, searching for any kind of uh, hue or you know. I mean, so it, it would it would grab whatever I had picked rather than whatever the color of the car was. And I and as soon as I saw the car enter the turn, I started bursting so that I could get this particular image where he comes over that track. Another part of planning and another part of that whole idea that there's only a few turns that uh, create competition is in the in most race race uh, scenarios, the start of the race is always the most uh, dramatic. 
and this is mid Ohio up in uh, near Columbus, Ohio, and they come down the back straightaway and they come into those turns and every car is fighting for a position. So there's going to be a good chance that there's going to be aggressive driving. So rather than uh, stay, stay into a position where uh, I could get a good close up, I went up on top of a hill, which was a spectator area. So this is an area, this is an example of where I didn't need access. And I just waited for the start of the race. And I've done this about 10 years and only two years did I have any result. But, you know, because there wasn't an accident, you don't want accidents, but, but I stood up there and I waited for them to come down around and there was. And so I was lucky to uh, be able to capture the chaos that, that occurred uh, at the start of this race. And then I got a little bit of a, an additional shot of the camaraderie between the two racers that are out of the race after about 30 seconds and probably, you know, a million dollars worth of damage. So this was something that I put in that planning category where I knew that I didn't want to be anywhere else on the track but at the start where I thought perhaps there might be something going on that I might be able to, to capture. This is planning that, that I didn't expect where the driver asked me if I wanted to get in a car with them and drive around the track after an exhibition. And I said, sure. And he said, do you want a helmet? And I said, no, because I want to take some pictures. And so I got in without a helmet and I was fastened in. And we started going around Michigan International Speedway. And I had a 14 millimeter lens. And it turns out if I would actually put that up to my face to shoot, I would probably had a concussion because <laughs> of the, the, the aggressiveness of the car and the all the movement of the car. So I just photographed without looking through it. And I came up with a couple of shots like this. So that wasn't planned, but it worked out okay. This was planned because this was at uh, Atlanta, a uh, road Atlanta, and it was for what's called uh, drift racing. And it's very boring racing because they're not really racing, they're doing an exhibition. But I noticed, this was the first time I ever photographed them, that there was a sand pit where if they did have a problem, they would go to the sand pit. So I just decided to stay at the sand pit or focus on the sand pit and wait for something to happen. And I ended up with uh, a shot that was pretty dramatic. I talked about weather and you know, obviously you can't control weather, but racing photography, if you're going to photograph races, they're usually between one and five in the afternoon, which means high, sky, high sun, a lot of contrast, a lot of shadows. So when the weather is bad, you get better pictures. This is in the pits at, uh, at uh, the Barber Motor Sport Park over in Birmingham, in, uh, Alabama. And uh, the clouds coming in, uh, the, the, the darkness allowed for me with a wide angle lens to create a more of a dramatic image. But when the weather really gets bad uh, and the, uh, you know, the cars are running through uh, a lot of water. There's a lot of mist that gets kicked up. A lot of, a lot of uh, foggish type of type of atmosphere. So I love that. It's you know it, it creates a different concern because I have to have a a, a uh, protection on my lenses and cameras and stuff. But but the images I think are much more dramatic. This one is very similar to the one that I said wasn't any good because it was just like the car was stalled in the middle of the road. Uh, but because of the wetness and the, and the late sun and the color and the gray, I think it, it created a little bit more dramatic uh, picture as this one does too. Again, he could be stopped, but with all the color and the reflection from the water, the, the weather uh, creates the image and not so much the, uh, the, the photography, the, the, you know, the, it's, it's not create, creating a race photography. Back to stacking and, back, and this part of the weather, uh, these, are, these are going to be a bunch of images that are very similar. They're all within uh, the same frame of stacking, a little bit of tilting. The weather creates the, the ambiance, I think. This one is the opposite of planning. I was walking away from where I was shooting and I was walking back to the 
it, this is uh, again in Birmingham at the Mo uh, Barber Motorsport. And I, I noticed that I could, from where I was, I could look down on a track through these trees and see a little bit of the racetrack. So I just decided to wait there and see some cars come by and I started shooting them. And luckily, without waiting too long, a green car and a red car came by, which just worked perfectly because it's complementary colors. And they, they fit in that little uh, area of view. Uh, so I was pretty happy about that. But that was not an accident, but it's certainly not something I pre-thought about. Then panning. Then that's, uh, you know, Tom was talking about how important panning is. And in racing, the most dramatic, I think, images are uh, the panned images. And it does take a lot of practice. And there's a number of things to consider. But if you want to get the feel of speed, uh, panning is the way to go. And the way I look at panning is, thank God for digital, because when I was shooting black and white or film back in the old days, you couldn't tell what you were doing. But here you can you can experiment with the shutter speeds. Uh, but here's my rule, th my rule of thumb. I use a low uh, shutter speed, obviously enough to create the movement from the for the background, but an, enough shutter speed that I don't get too much vertical uh, flex from moving the camera as they go by. I look for a, not a straightaway, but a long, uh, wide radius turn so that the cars come around and I can stay uh, focused on them without them moving out of the plane of focus. I use a uh, wide open or, or more open aperture so the background blurs more than it, than it would because the more blur in the background from the aperture, the better the blur in the pan. And I normally, uh, I normally spot focus on the, uh, I go ma full manual. I go manual focus, manual exposure, because I don't want the camera trying to figure out what I'm looking at. I focus in the middle of the track or where I think the car is going to go. And I, uh, I pre-focus to that point. I set the shutter speed. That gives me the blur that I want with the background that I want. And then I just turn uh, along with the, uh, with the movement of the, of the car to try to maintain a level approach. So I do that mostly with my hips and not with my shoulders or my arms. And I look for backgrounds that are complementary to certain cars. So I take pictures of a lot of different cars coming by, but it's usually the cars that have red accents that go with red backgrounds or blue accents go with blue backgrounds. And I get a lot of bad pictures because <laughs> it's a hit and miss. This one, there's a whole bunch of things that I did wrong. I was too close, wrong focal length. I, I didn't, they were going downhill. Uh, so I had to try to pan along with that uh, elevation change. Lots of things went wrong with this. This one, a lot of things went wrong too, but I, I look at this one as maybe lemon. Lemonades out of lemons, because I kind of like the image, but clearly uh, it's not like the other pans. And I threw this one in just to talk about that uh, this is not limited to IndyCar. It's any type of racing, any type of motorsports. I remember somebody had a picture of a, of a dirt bike, I think, or something a few months ago, and they were talking about panning. This isn't panning, obviously, but... Uh, but if you understand a sport, you can wait for the things to happen in front of you, you can anticipate, and you can get a shot like this. The last part of this would be that uh, I'm a street photographer primarily, so when I'm also at the track, I'm looking for, when, when there's not important racing going on, I'm looking at the crowd and I'm looking for other scenes that I think uh, create an interesting uh, visual narrative of the race community. Uh, I, I get into the pits and I photograph the guys in the pits. Uh, there's, I think there's interesting stories going on. All of these things you could do without access. You don't need a media credential to, to take those pictures. Okay, this thanks, Joe. Sorry to cut you off. Um, that's, I mean, they're just fantastic photos. What? I only um, have two more. Okay. Can I? Okay, go two. on. Let me just, please let me finish with two. This okay. Ilya Castroneves and Tony Kanan 
if you're at all interested in Indy 500, Elio won the Indy 500 two weeks ago. Uh, the oldest player, the oldest driver to ever win, and he and he's uh, one of the only one of the fourth drivers to win it four times. And they were talking, and I photographed this from the pits. And a friend of mine sent this picture to me from the internet. And if you look over on the right hand side, there I am taking the picture, uh, which was like. To me, how did my friend ever see me over there? Um, mm. And and that's the end of it. So thank you. Sorry, I went over a little bit. Uh, it's, it's all right. Thanks, Joe. Oh, that um, was great, Joe. Thank you. Yeah. A bit of a change of pace now. We're going to Ken's going to talk to us about covered bridge photography, and I don't think motion blur is going to be a problem. Uh, no, it won't. Uh, unless they uh, all of a sudden get up and move which would probably be unusual, but all right. Uh, I'd like to start with, uh, get, obviously we're gonna be a little tight on time. So uh, let's just get this down to here. I just wanted to do a little background on covered bridges itself and talk about why they are covered. Uh, if I break up, by the way, my computer has been going through some internet unstable issues over the last 15 minutes, so I hope I don't break up. Why are bridges covered? A lot of people want to know what that is, and there's been a lot of uh, folklore and so forth as to why bridges are covered. Uh, animals thought they thought it would be more comfortable for them. Uh, the cover up all the interior woodwork, uh, keep snow off the travel portion, which is actually different. Most of the people who were the toll keepers or the people in charge of the bridges paid people to throw snow so the sleds would go over it a lot easier and then offered privacy to the courting couples, hence the name Kissing Bridges. But basically, the bridges were covered for economic reasons. Uh, the lifespan of a bridge without covering, uh, particularly the, the truss work that supports it, would be about 10 years. And it would be very expensive to replace the truss work as it would go on. A covered bridge could last up to 75, 50, 75, 100. And there are some bridges right now that are original that have been repaired, of course, but are over 195 years old. Uh, the first documented, oh, let's get this off of here. There we go. The first documented covered bridge in the United States was in Philadelphia. A little bit of interest uh, over the Schuylkill River it was built in 1805. It was done by a Massachusetts millwright, Timothy Palmer. It was typical of a lot of the projects at the time. Uh, the original work on the bridge fell out or had problems, financial backing problems, and only when they brought Timothy Palmer in was it completed. And it was initially not supposed to be a covered bridge, but the uh, Land, uh, the person who owned the land next to it, a judge, Richard Peters, decided that he thought it would be nice if it was covered, roofed, and painted. And this is a picture, well, a drawing of what that first bridge in the United States looked like over the Schuylkill. In total, more than 12,000 bridges were built in the United States, with Ohio having the most at the time, about 3,500. As of last year, there is approximately 950 bridges still left, the authentic covered bridges. I'm not talking about ones that cover the creeks and the golf courses. Despite the number of covered bridges built in our country, we were not the people who started that. It's a European and an Asian uh, style or system, and it was started in the 1570s in Italy. The oldest existing covered bridges in the United States date back to 1825. Uh, the Hyde Hall from New York and the Hassan Plug from Pennsylvania. Actually, the Hassan Plug is about two months younger than the Hyde Hall, and the Hassan Plug is still standing, obviously. Pennsylvania is basically the number one state with the most existing covered bridges in the country right now. 
209 remain as of last year. And Lancaster County has 29, which is real close by, and it's second to Park County, Indiana, with 31. At one point in history, Pennsylvania also had the longest covered bridge in the world at 5,950 feet. It was located not too far from here between Columbia and Wrightsville. It spanned the Susquehanna River and featured railroad tracks, a towpath for canal boats, plus a carriage, wagon, and pedestrian road. It was rebuilt after being destroyed by an ice jam in 1832, and then it was burned in 1863 during the Gettysburg Campaign to prevent the Confederates getting across it to get over to, I believe it's Wrightsville. And then it was rebuilt again and destroyed by a cyclone in 1896. This is what it looked like at the time. This is from a postcard. And the bridge still covers the same path. And if you drive down Route 30 heading west, you'll see it off to your left. It's not a covered bridge, but you also see the stands, the supports for that bridge. Juniata County has in Pennsylvania the longest bridge. It's called the Academia Bridge. It was built in 1870. It's also one of the most expensive bridges to maintain in the state due to damage, repair, uh, vandalism, and so forth. They've spent over one and a half million dollars, and they've also installed a security camera system. These are just some of the sources I use. I like to look at the history of the bridge, find a little bit of information about it. There's a great web page. Facebook books, uh, Harold Silver and Fred Mall, who is from Quitstown area, has done a lot of work on covered bridges in our area and some of the societies. In taking pictures of bridges, most people talk about and most views you will see of a covered bridge have five basic views. The portals or the entrances you straight on, but you got to be careful for cars, not only blocking your view, but coming up behind you. Uh, three quarter view is the side in the portal and the side view is very rewarding as, I, as you see there, but also is quite of uh, challenging to capture because a lot of obviously there are over streams and a lot of them being in rural areas, it makes it difficult to um, sometimes get a really good side view. And in, uh, shortly after this, I'm going to be doing or showing you some pictures in a slideshow and you will see some of them and you see why it's difficult to get side views. You also wanna see some pictures or take pictures of the interior. Uh, exposure can be a problem in there. And most of the ones that I'll be showing on the interior are from Bedford County. And the reason for that is they have more open sides, which allow it easier to be photographed. And lastly, you wanna take a look at the surrounding area, the landscape where the bridge is set. In many cases, there's some very nice uh, farmland, open areas, uh, interesting historical historical buildings around them that you can incorporate into the picture. Also, depending on how open the area is where the bridge is located, you can actually take pictures from 360 around the bridge. And what I would also suggest, if you want to do good side views, if you have any good waders, uh, I would bring those along because the creeks aren't really deep in most cases and you can get out into the middle of the creek and get some excellent side views. Okay, let me just close this out and I'm gonna bring up the slideshow. Okay, share screen, here we go. All right, try that again. There we go. 
These are going to be coming in order. You're going to see the portals or the entrances for the first uh, few pictures. And as you look at the pictures, you'll see the name of the bridge across the top. Uh, the bottom left has the camera settings. Uh, the date information is over on the right. The times may not be correct. And where there is no camera information on the lower left, I should say, those are film shots that I've taken. I usually take both film and digital, both color and black and white when I'm out. And these start the three quarters view, the quarter view where you see the portal and the side. This bridge no longer exists. Side views now. And this is an example of difficulty. Interiors now. and some of the landscape or the areas around it. Okay, does anybody have any pictures to share? I can do that, Lee, if we have time. We've got a couple, we've got about a minute. All right, I'll, I'll just, show, yep. I'll show a couple real fast. Yep. See my screen? Yep. Doesn't look like a covered bridge. 
It is a covered bridge. We're seeing reading. Oh, really? Now, there we go. I see a covered bridge. Yep. Whoa. That's an HDR. And that's what I have. Thanks, Ken. Hey, thanks, welcome, thanks, Vince. Ken. Thanks, Ken. For me, it's interesting because I don't think we've got any covered bridges in Australia, and the the uh, architecture inside is fascinating. Yeah, Thank you. Nice, nice, Ken. Nice collection, Ken. Okay, yeah, the, so the now we go on. No, that's all right. Go ahead. We. I was just going to say we're going to move into a more contemplative mode now. Um, Larry's going to talk to us about flower photography. So okay. Larry, take it away. Oh, okay, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, I think I have about uh, 20, 25 pictures to go through, and uh, they're all sort of self-explanatory. They've been all shot with a Nikon D500 with a 105 uh, macro lens, uh, 2.8 uh, millimeter lens on them. And uh, they range from anywhere from, some of them are up in the state of Vermont, some from Monocacy Hill, which is down around Douglasville, uh, Rodale Gardens, which is in the outskirts of Kutztown and only several blocks away from my QTH here. Uh, a park down near uh, near Oli that ha some of them have been from and also from up at Hawk Mountain. You think of Hawk Mountain being a, a bird place and all with which it is, but they have some very nice uh, wildflowers up there also. So let me see if I can uh, bring things uh, things up here. Okay, can, can everybody see that? Yeah. Okay, first one is just a, a plain, plain rose and everything. That's actually from, uh, from our garden here. Oh yeah, no. How do I get to the next one? <laughs> you might be able to use the arrow key on your keyboard. Oh, okay. Maybe. Right. I'm really, I'm really new with uh... the arrow down at the bottom. I don't know. Yeah, that, that's what I'm. But I'm maybe doing. not if you have this, if you have that menu down, you might not be able to. So get rid of that. Now try your arrow key or mouse over to the right hand side. There, an arrow might appear. I don't know. No. Yeah, usually, usually it does or what on here. And that, I, oh, wait, let me, uh, let me get. Uh, Okay, there we go. There it Thanks, is. Thanks, Jenny. Mm -hmm. I think it was Jenny. Okay, it was. next next one is a uh, balloon flower, which was uh, photographed uh, here locally on the property. Some uh, bleeding hearts after a, a rainstorm, which are part of uh, Joanne and my property. A uh, clematis, which is uh, also on our our property. This is a columbine, and uh, right off the bat of top of my head, I can't remember where that was really taken at. Uh, a crocus. Just a plain old daffodil which I love, love yellow. I think yellow is one of my favorite colors in, in flowers. A daylily. This is a European columbine. And uh, I, don't, I don't know, I was trying to think a while ago where that was taken. It wasn't, wasn't locally here, but, uh, and for some of these with a black background here, we, Joanne does shots also. We have a, a mat board about a 
maybe 16 by 20 mat board mounted on a frame to give us a nice uh, black background, which I think uh, helps to bring out some of the flowers sometimes. This one here is a false Solomon seal. There is a Solomon seal plant, but uh, this is sort of a, wants to try and imit imitate that one and it's not really, and that's why they call it a, a false Solomon seal. An iris. This one here is a martagone lily. And uh, these we purchased bulbs from uh, Longwood Gardens quite a few years ago and somewhat they have taken over some of the flower beds around the house. They have really, really done very well. And I think they're a very decorative type of, uh, of flower. Uh, orchids. This is a pawpaw blossom. There's a state park down in Maryland, near Northeast Maryland, along the, uh, the Elk River down there. And uh, they have quite a, quite a few of these uh, pawpaw plants, which uh, do uh, produce fruit. Uh, what they do pr produce a, uh, a fruit, which I've, I've never, never tasted it. Mm. A peony. Some pink uh, lady slippers, which uh, I think these were taken at a place up near Wilkes-Barre, Scranton area called Archibald State Park. And uh, it was a little funny story when we went up there to photograph them, we got up there and we didn't know exactly where the place was. So we stopped at a little gas station and asked the guy where Archipel State Park was. And what it is, is a huge hole in the ground from, a, I guess, a glacier years ago. And the guy at the gas station said, where'd you come from? So we told him, he said, you mean to tell me you drove all the way up here just to see a hole in the ground? <laughs> we said, no, we came up to see the flowers. So. Oh, beautiful. Uh, okay, yeah, these, these are showy lady slippers. And these are at a uh, preserve and bog area up around Woodstock, Vermont. And uh, they bloom just about somewhere around June 20th every year. And we've been thinking about uh, maybe taking a trip up this year. It's been several years since we were up to see them. It, it's an absolutely beautiful, beautiful place. There's a lot of other bog plants in the uh, in the bog also, but uh, these here I think are only found about three or four locations in the United States. They're very, very quite uh, quite rare. This is a Siam tulip, a trillium which was up at uh, Hawk Mountain. This is a trumpet honeysuckle. I think it's very, very uh, type of a decorative uh, plant. It will, it will open up and have it all with it later on. That's not the final bloom. This is a uh, tulip tree flower, which we have on the property. That was very, very small when we moved here. And I don't know how many feet tall it is now, but it has thousands of, uh, of these flowers on it in the springtime. Water lilies that were uh, taken at, at uh, Longwood. This is a wild azalea. This is a location that we discovered from a uh, guided walk one time down at uh, French Creek State Park. And uh, 
we also used a, uh, a black backdrop to emphasize the, uh, the flower a little bit more. Okay. While it, oh, this, no, this is okay. This is a winter aconite, winter aconite flower and a yellow lady slipper, which uh, was photographed at uh, an Octacy Hill Park. And it's, uh, it's quite quite a walk to get to, the, to this park. And I think that maybe this is one of my last years that I'm gonna be able to make the, uh, the trek there. My walking certainly uh, isn't that, that good anymore. So that's, uh, that's it, Lay. Thanks very much, Larry. Has anybody else got any flower photos they'd like to share? Um, I know Vince has been doing some macros on photo on I flowers. Throw up a couple if nobody else does. I've got some, but I can't. I'm not sure I can share my screen, so I'll try yours. Okay. Uh, someone has to stop sharing. Yeah, I gotta get out of. Uh... Okay, Ginny, why, why did Down my- the bottom, it says, uh, sorry, up at the very top, it probably says stop sharing. A little oh, green, okay, a green okay, thing. Okay, okay, there, there we go. go. It was red, Ginny, oh, you're colorblind. I'm sorry, I thought it was, <laughs> thought it was green. I, I wasn't oh, no, looking no. at it right there. Just, just pulling your leg. Oh, you're <laughs> so crazy. Body. Can you see my picture? Yes. Yep. These are macros from Chanticleer in Malvern. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, well, any, anybody, we've got time, got a few minutes. Does anybody want to talk about earlier things? ask questions um yeah i had i see my, my zoomed in well, the heck's the... we see you dave oh there you are i was on a different screen i had a, a picture of a panorama that i took i wanted to um ask a question about sure. let me just get back to it here <sighs> well that's coming up thanks larry Yes, those are beautiful Thanks, flowers, Larry. Larry. Thank you, everybody. Okay, so come on, Pitcher, come on. Everything always seems to take time when you're <laughs> trying to do it. Oh, come on. Oh, there we go. Now I got to share screen. Come on. Share screen. So, can you see the panorama of the river? Not yet. Uh, ah, not yet. Really, it's on my screen. There, there it is. That's it. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, I, I don't recall how many shots I took, but I would just guess by the, the dimensions of things because I shoot vertical. There would have been about one, two, three, at least four. And my question is, um, if I want to do multi-row, um, I could then have started over toward the left there and went higher and got more of the, the framing, you know, of the, what do you call it? The gazebo or whatever it's kind of thing that's in there. And then if I shoot across, if I get all the way to the right, do I just drop down and then go toward the left? And then a third row, I would drop down and go toward the right. Is that, is that the way you would do a multi-row? Good question, Dave. No, you're supposed to go back to the left side. The software works best left to right, row okay. by row. So you would uh, do your second, your um, top row first, then your middle row, then the last row. But always going right. left to right. Okay, I, that's what I was wondering if the software enabled you to just like shoot straight across, drop down, and then like kind of zigzag and and get it. Theoretically, we'll do that, but if it's if the image does not have perfect focus and depth of field, 
strong enough, it's going to have a problem. So uh, the, best bet is the, the recommendation is always left to right if, um, to get it the best for your, your uh, matching up. Mm -hmm. And just, just one note of reference, I think on when you did the description about the, or whoever did the description about uh, panoramas, that if you're going to do a left to right, it's better to hold your camera in the portrait mode so that you get more at the top and bottom if you're only going to do one row. Uh, so yes, that's correct. Uh, and that would be true whether you're doing one row or multiple rows, because again, it, it increases the size of the final image, which typically is good as long as your computer can handle a one or two gigabyte image. Um, right. And um, um, it gives you more space, uh, greater field of view to crop down as you need to. So, and to cover your mistakes if you mess up on your top or bottom row. So you should always do your, ideally, they should be done vertically. All and I do, I do vertical panoramas with the exact opposite thing where I put it in landscape mode and shoot at the bottom and go up, especially uh, like yeah. buildings or something, but you get that, what do you call it when the things come together at the top? Keystoning. Keystoning, yeah. So yeah. When you do a verterama, which is what that's called, uh, you do that in a portrait mode, horizontal, because um, you need the width. You're, you're one, it's the same thought process as when you do your horizontal panorama, you want that taller width. So when you do your vertical panorama, you want the wider width going up. Yeah, so I shoot in landscape mode, yeah. Yeah, you can actually do a verterama as a 360. So when you get to the top, the ceiling of the dome of a building, you then turn the camera around and now come down the backside. Oh, wow. Yeah, That would so, work good at the Valley Forge Arch. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm, I'm hoping to be able to master that technique. I haven't mastered it. Um, but that's what you do. When you, when you make the U-turn at the top, you spin the camera 180 degrees, now you come down. And oh, okay. Um, they be upside down. You'll have to flip them. Okay, I'll try that. I'm, I'm going to call an end to the official part of the meeting um, and thank our presenters very much. You can all clap. Uh, I think it was extremely educational and some fantastic photos. I'm being new, I guess, to the club. I'm just amazed at the depth of talent 